All right, dog owners need to uh, listen to this show. And uh, due to the nature of my guest and uh, the things he does, anyone who owns a pet should listen closely. With me now is John Potash. How's it going, man? Very good. Thanks for having me. No, I know we've been talking about having you on. I know you've got a time limit here, so we'll uh, try to get our conversation going here. I know things were not so great recently, but you're doing a little better now. Yeah, yeah, you know, life happens, and uh, we just have to manage and get through it. All right, we'll talk a little bit about your work here today. Um, You still have uh, all those critters? Uh, What what, what reptiles are you keeping nowadays? Well, um, I have a nice uh, collection of rattlesnakes, uh, of course, that I use for education and displays and, of course, the dog training. Right, and that's what we're going to talk about in a bit. You You just have the rattlesnakes now? No, no, I do sell a few other odds and ends. Uh, I have a variety of colubrids, things I like to work with, blue beauties, false water cobras, a uh, couple scaleless projects. Um, of course, your your standard ball pythons, I have a handful of those. And still have a couple berms that I've had for 20 years now and a uh, smattering of other things. That's right. You do education work with those. So you still got all the colubrids and the uh, other snakes and stuff. You got the lizards still? I do. Um, I have a pair of beaded, <laughs> including Snuffy, who came from you, who laid uh, 10 eggs earlier this year. Oh, how cool. Um, so you yeah, pair- only, you pair- only two are good, but for a first time go around, I'm happy with that. You paired her up? I did. Was she? Did I know she was female or did we not know what she was? Actually, she was uh, the one that was suspected to be male, and the male oh, okay. was suspected to be female, and, well, it just didn't work out that way. Oh, okay. Well, it worked out kind of for you. Um, yeah, I know we got it, and I wasn't planning on breeding it anytime soon. They said it's male, so I just went with that. We never probed it or anything like that or checked it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I was toying around with taking them into a vet to, or her, into a vet to uh, see about maybe ultrasounding or something along those lines. And then uh, somebody just said, ah, throw them together. And uh, depending yeah. on what happens, you'll be able to tell what they are. Is that so how I they, did and is, bred. Is that how they <laughs> sex beaded lizards? I've never sexed one before. Yeah, it's not easy, that's for sure. Oh, okay. The, they're not pink and blue. They make it hard. All right. Uh, you, you have an interesting job. Ex- uh, we're talking about the dog training. Explain to us what you do with Get Rattled. All right. Well, basically what we do is we teach dogs to recognize and avoid the sight, sound, and smell of rattlesnakes. Mm. Uh, That's the generic description. (laughs) Normally you just think of them uh, when they come upon one seeing one, but uh, it's it's the sights and the sounds. Right, because you never know how a dog's going to come across them. In fact, I, I would believe that most dogs probably smell them before they ever see them or hear them Uh, in a lot of cases when they're out especially off leash and they're sniffing around um, we do get a lot of hunting clientele so they're you know training their dogs to find birds and flush them so they're always sticking their noses in in places that could be dangerous yeah when dogs get bit they uh they get usually bit right on the face right because they're checking it out Right. More often than not, their bite's going to be uh, on the nose, on the face, maybe uh, the chest or front paws, something that indicates that that dog was very curious about the snake or even maybe uh, aggressively attacking the snake. Right, right. And uh, you talked about people like hunters uh, or people that uh, live in areas where uh, the, the snakes are there as well. If you're over here in like the California Central Valley, it's not as big a problem unless, of course, you're, you take them out hunting or fishing or or hiking, or as long as you don't keep them just in the house, you know. Um, but if they're in areas where the rattlesnakes occur naturally, uh, these, these are these are animals uh, that uh, you might want to get trained. Definitely, and we do get that question quite often. Um, some people will be like, "Should I have my dog trained?" So we we'll have, have to ask them those series of questions. I mean, if their dog rarely gets off the the couch and, you know, doesn't look for anything more than uh, snacks or a remote control, then (laughs) obviously they're probably not a good candidate for this training. But anybody who uh, likes to take their dog out camping or hiking or fishing, of course, the hunting, or they just live uh, in an area where snakes could end up in their own backyard, which actually happens quite a lot. Um, 
then definitely they would want to consider doing this training. Right. So we're in uh, we're in California. There are areas where these uh, animals occur, uh, but people may not know that the rattlesnakes are there. So what are the areas around, say, Northern California, and Nevada, where uh, they might the dogs might come upon a, a venomous snake? Realistically, I would say any property that's within. I would even go so far as to say, you know, a, a mile or two from. Uh, you know, unpopulated areas uh, are at risk. Uh, something I learned back in my, my wildlife rescue days is the vast majority of encounters are in communities that butt up against hills or next to BLM open land. Um, but we have found rattlesnakes in some of the most peculiar locations that really made me scratch my head and think, how the heck did this thing get here? Did it really just travel that far and go unnoticed for that long? Hmm. Or maybe it hitched a riot in a car, you know, somebody parked somewhere and it went up into the car to get cool or something and ended up to hitchhiking. Maybe it was a something somebody caught, let go, released. You just never know what the circumstances are. Um, those, of course, are just those odd scenarios, but definitely, um, you know, within a good mile or two of open land. Another thing to consider is if there's any construction um, in the area, especially, again, of open land. Um, that has a tendency to really just stir things up and, and make the snake encounters very prevalent. Right, and you have uh, an interesting uh, job for sure. Can you, uh, d- d- what, what methods do you use to uh, train these dogs to actually avoid the snakes? All right, uh, what it is, it's an aversion training. So we do use the electric collars. And basically what we do is we set up a course with a variety of different stations to focus the dog's attention on different aspects of the snakes. For instance, the first snake encounter they have on our course is a snake out in the open. We want that first encounter to be as natural as possible. So we just kind of walk a dog in, let them take the lead. You know, we want them to kind of be in that alpha mindset Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just let them sniff around. Now we might kind of lead them to that air general area and once the dog discovers the snake on their own uh, that's when they would receive a correction from the collar so and like this, expose- this would be oh, like, sorry, a, uh, like a dog coming up on a trail where a rattlesnake might be warming up on the trail that happens in the mornings and in the evenings absolutely yeah. and um you know we, we just want that because you know if you're going for scent first uh, we do actually focus a couple of the different stations on scent, um, but we like them to kind of get that visual first. If we do the scent first and then they come across the other one, they may not get the full package. Um, so that's why we choose to do it that way. And, um, yeah, we'll expose a couple different ways, upwind, downwind, you know, from different directions um, until the dog shows that they, you know, recognize that as the particular threat. And, uh, you know, of course, that varies per dog. It really varies per breed a lot, too. Um, some some dogs may only take one correction and at that station, and then they got it. Other dogs will maybe want to check it out because they're still curious, or they might even want to challenge it. Some breeds are notorious for that. And they may take even five or six different corrections before they finally give up and say, all right, you win. Um, after we know they have that healthy respect of, the snake there, we move on to uh, our scent stations. And one of them is a live snake inside of a uh, wire box. We typically butt that up against uh, either rocks or a bush, kind of camouflage it a little bit. And uh, again, we just walk them around, let them just sniff and let their noses find it on their own. And once the dog uh, does that, again, they would receive the correction. Another one that we fairly recently started using is to simulate a hole. Dogs love to stick their noses in holes. Um, so again, you know, we'd walk them by this area and uh, let their nose take them right into that that opening, the hole. And they would receive a correction again at that point. Um, and then, uh, you know, that that, that we, we also throw in a couple false obstacles, if you will, because we don't want the dog to think, well, every time I walk up to something, it sucks. <laughs> so we'll throw in a few false obstacles here and there, let the dog sniff around and do their thing without any kind of, you know, corrections whatsoever. Um, pretty much in the end, once they, they understand and recognize it all, that's when we do 
an owner recall exercise. We'll have the owner come out and have them stand on one side. We'll have the dog on the other, the snake in the middle, and have them call their dog to them. Now, we don't let go of the leash because, you know, the, we don't want a dog to run off or something bad to happen, but we give them loose bleed. We just hang the leash there, and they make the decision on their own. And essentially what we're watching for is the dog to actively avoid. And sometimes that could be by them just refusing to go to their owners over there, and sometimes it could just be them making a gigantic circle around the snake to get to them. And that's pretty much how we know that the dog recognizes and understands it. Yeah, and you said some dogs take a number of times with, with the corrections, but uh, is it just a one-day thing, like uh, one day they learn it and then the next year they don't have to do the training? Or do you recommend that people do this um, on a regular basis to reinforce uh, the idea to stay away from the animals? That's a really good question. Um, our recommendation is to go through the initial training and then a reinforcement training within about a year or so. Um, the initial training can be anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20 minutes on a rare occasion. The dog might be a little more difficult and it might take longer, but I'd say, you know, that 15 minutes is a fair average for most dogs. Um, and of course, a lot of people ask, well, do they really get it in that short of time? And yeah. the answer is yes, that's, they absolutely do. It's pretty quick. Cool. Um, yeah. Once, once they understand it, you know, it's an aversion training. It's not like you're teaching your dog to sit and you can say sit a million times and give them treats and there's just nothing bad about it. This one, you know, once they learn it and they're doing everything they're supposed to do, it, there's just no point to keep, uh, you know, trying to beat it into them. Um, but we like to say give them a year because that kind of gives us a chance to see the dog, how well he remembered it over that time and to give a, a reinforcement if he gives us an opportunity. And some dogs, you know, will come in and want nothing to do with it. Uh, a lot of dogs, what seems to happen is they come in and you just kind of see the wheels turning. They'll stop, they'll perk their ears, they do little subtle, uh, body language movements that tell you that they're thinking, that they're remembering something. And if we give them a correction in that moment, it just kind of cements it in. Um, after the first and second training, it's really kind of an owner choice. Uh, we have some owners who bring their dog in every year just to make sure they remember. Mm -hmm. um, we have others that maybe skip two, three, four years in between. Uh, sometimes they'll just not bring them back until maybe the dog sees a snake, and uh, if if they're concerned, they may bring them back then. But definitely the first and second training is, is crucial for them to really get it long-term. Right. And are there, are there any studies that have shown that, uh, you know, a couple of sessions, uh, first year, second year, um, that it sticks with them? You know, that's one thing I have never seen in any kind of study or um, experiment that's been done. Uh, pretty much everything we have is basically anecdotal, our own personal experiences. Right. And, you know, uh, I've seen all different aspects. I've seen the longest time I've personally seen for myself, and it's happened twice now, uh, was eight years between a first and a second training. And in both of those cases, the dogs remembered perfectly. They, they didn't even need mm. a, a reinforcement correction at all. But we have had other dogs that come in and then do need to be reminded. Um, so anecdotally, basically, we've found that that is, the best scenario um, is the first and second training. A few trainers will recommend a third. I don't really see any harm in that. Um, it's cheap insurance to make sure that the dog remembers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not a bad idea just to go ahead and do these sessions every year. It doesn't hurt anything. You said a lot of people do that? Yeah, uh, uh, we do have quite a few people who do that. And realistically, it's cheaper than even the rattlesnake vaccine. And, uh, you know, of course, there again, you have a... You avoid the problem altogether in the vet bill, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The vaccine, you don't even really know, does it work, does it not work? Yeah. There's never been uh, any studies that I've seen published and on that. And it's not like it, it makes a complete immunity to it if your dog's bitten by a rattlesnake and you use the vaccine to still take it to a vet, right? Right. That's what all the vets tell you is... If your dog gets bitten after being vaccinated, you still want to get them in immediately for treatment. Um, essentially, their sales pitch is that it's just trying to 
buy you some time to minimize the long-term effects of the bite. Um, again, I, I really don't know how effective it is, but you know, just like the training, can't hurt to you know maybe give them that extra yeah. advantage. Better to just avoid the bite altogether. So when when you do the Absolutely. training and the dog comes upon a snake that he's been um, conditioned to avoid, is it like a fear response or is it more like he's obeying, kind of he thinks he's been told not to go near it, so he does it? Well, that's one thing about our training um, versus maybe some of the ones out there that say it's a positive reinforcement training. Uh, the positive reinforcement is your dog trying to please you. So if you're out walking across the snake, and the owner's there with the dog, your dog may react appropriately to please the owner. But if your dog's off their own, <laughs> it's a whole other scenario. With our training, we want the dog to be in an alpha mindset. We let them take the lead. Basically, we do what we call ugly walking. We don't heal them. We don't, uh, you know, uh, keep a firm control of them. We basically have them on a leash just you know, for our own and out of the dog's protection. But um, they, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Basically, uh, the alpha mindset basically is them doing their own thing. So when they get that correction a couple times, they remember it as like, oh, the snake was bad. It wasn't anybody telling me not to do it. Mm -hmm. It's the snake that did this to me. So that's the way we prefer to do it is uh, have that dog think, Snake equals bad. I kind of like to tell people, it's like trying to teach a kid not to touch the hot stove. You can tell them a million times, don't do it, it's bad, it'll hurt. The minute you turn your back, that kid's going to reach over and touch it because, <laughs> yeah, you know, they're still you're not there. Yeah. Uh, once they do it, though, they learn, oh, yeah, that sucked. I'm not going to do it again. And that's kind of how I equate the training to the dog. Oh, that's good. But do you get people that just simply don't like the, the electric collars? Right, and that, that is a fairly controversial issue. Um, in fact, I just was uh, on a, a forum earlier where a person who does this training said that he turned the collar up to the max to train the dog. Uh, in my experience, that's just a horrible idea. It's a bad thing to do. Um, once you correct the dog on that kind of a stimulation, they have a tendency to go into panic mode, they go into flight mode, uh, they they stop thinking clearly. Uh, our method is a lot more, I don't know, regulated, if you will. We ask each and every dog owner a series of questions about their dog. And essentially what we're trying to do is uh, get a snapshot of, of the particular dog. Is he super prey driven or is he pretty laid back? Uh, we ask about, of course, the age, any health conditions, uh, you know, we take breed into consideration and we adjust the collar for each individual dog to what we believe is going to be enough to really startle them, to get their attention, um, but not so much to put them into a complete panic type situation. Um, and in our experience, they learn a heck of a lot better that way. All right. So the pointer is not going to get the same uh, uh, electric load that the chihuahua is going to get, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, some breeds might surprise you, too. Um, there's plenty of big breeds that seem very sensitive to the collar. Um, and, of course, these are things we've really learned over the years um, working with dogs. Yeah. And so we take all those into consideration. Um, oftentimes, we have people who are concerned about the use of the collars. And I'll get it. You know, I love my dog. The thought of being through that isn't pleasant. But what we'll do is we'll let people feel the collar for themselves. And I, pretty much every time we've done that, their, their response, oh, that's it? <laughs> it really doesn't make sense. Yeah. This isn't is like a compliance type of situation. This is a startle fact. Give them enough. Oh, my God, what the Right, sorry, you kind of broke up at the end there. Are you still there? I am. Okay. Now, um, I was going to say, what kind of snakes do you use in the training? 
Oh, okay. Good question. Um, we have a variety of different species that we use for the visual and onboard exposure. We typically will use either Western Diamondbacks or Mojave rattlesnake, uh, just because those are the more aggressive species that will actually act appropriately. Uh, for the scent portion, we use whatever's native to the area that we're training in. Uh, there, there's a lot of questions that come up. Can a dog tell the difference between species of rattlesnake? Um, you, even so much, can they smell the venom of a rattlesnake? And uh, we honestly don't know the answers to that, but the way I look at it is you have an animal, the dog, who can smell bombs, who can smell drugs and coffee ground. They can smell diabetes and oncoming seizures and even cancer inside of a person's body. So why couldn't they tell the difference of smell between species or even smell the venom inside of a rattlesnake? So hmm, yeah, uh, but I assume they'd um, they'd avoid the all snakes altogether when they when they're trained though. Actually, that a per dog kind of occurrence. The oh. vast majority of them do, and I've heard some great stories. Um, one lady called me up uh, earlier this year. Her German Shepherd we'd trained two years prior, and she said she was just sitting watching TV. And all of a sudden, her dog jumps up and runs behind the couch. Couldn't figure out why. She was out there with a small caterpillar crawling on the carpet. <laughs> and he saw it and freaked out. Oh, it was a snake? Um, yeah, yeah it, wasn't, it wasn't even a snake. It was just snake-ish, and that was enough. Um, one, one person had their dog running through an agility trial, and... She said uh, he would jump over an obstacle and the leash fell or the collar fell off. And then he kept running. And when he came back around to it, the way the collar was in an S laying on the ground, he put on the brakes and stopped. Uh, she said, you know, that was great for seeing that he still recognizes, you know, at least the shape of the snake. But she said it was horrible because he lost the, the agility trial. <laughs> um, and I've heard of dogs avoiding all kinds of snakes afterwards. I even heard a few stories of dogs who avoided scorpions after the training, which is kind of what made me start to think, could they maybe smell that venom? Um, don't know. Could just be coincidence, but um, something to take into consideration. So, However, on the other end, <laughs> I've also heard that some dogs were very specific, that they would still be interested in lizards, garter snakes, even gopher snakes, but stayed away from rattlesnakes. So, you know, I, I think it's kind of like, equating you to maybe just some lay person they may see a snake and not have a clue what it is whereas you would know instantly what species it is dangerous or not i think some of the dogs maybe equate on a higher level to it as well yeah i've talked before about people training their dogs to go herping you know so they could uh they could push uh say go get them and they'll find all the snakes under all the rocks for you it'd be interesting to be able to train a dog to do that and uh yeah i'm I've still been toying with that idea of, you know, uh, trying to do that myself. <laughs> Is that cheating? Uh, <laughs> probably, yeah, but, God, it would be so much fun. Because, you know, it would be very involved. You know, you'd have to teach the dog not only to sniff them out and find them, but point them from a safe distance and things of that nature. Yeah. I know it could be done, um, just like any other training. I just haven't had the time to dedicate to it which is why I haven't even gotten myself, you know, a, a dog to take traveling. So. <laughs> yeah, it'd be good if you have a target species that you just want to find king snakes, you just teach them to find king snakes, then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you keep the dogs and the owners safe? You say you use live snakes in your presentations as opposed to, uh, or in your training sessions, as opposed to uh, fake snakes like other people do. Right. Um, basically, what we do is we use venomoids. Um, and I know that's a very controversial topic amongst uh, reptile people, but, um, you know, the way I look at it... For those is, listening who don't know what that is, that'd be a venomous snake whose venom glands have been removed. Uh, basically. Actually, the ones we use, we don't have the full gland removed. We have done on them what's called a ductectomy, right. which is essentially the same concept as a vasectomy. Um, this is a minimally invasive surgery uh, where they cut out a section of the duct between the gland and the fang and then cauterize it. 
Oh, wow. And, okay. uh, I've talked to a few vets about that. Um, you know, a lot of, you hear stories all the time. Well, they can regrow it. Um, it's never been proven that they can. The few venomoids that have envenomated people or produced venom uh, from milking, nobody really knew the history on it. it. Was it a licensed veterinarian who did it? Was it an experienced veterinarian? Was it somebody doing a garage hack job? Nobody really knows. Um, I still test my snakes about once or twice a year just to make sure that there's no venom coming <laughs> how, out. How do you test and, that? You just try to milk them? Um, no, actually, uh, what I do now, uh, I have tried the milking before, but what I prefer to do now is just throw a rat in, in the cage with them, let them bite it, pull it out. If the rat died, then I would you know, be concerned about checking it further. But right. um, it never happened. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of venomoids, um, but I do have a few that we use out in the open you know, for safety and liability purposes. Right, and you yeah. said you mentioned a kind of a wire caging where the where the animals can't really get in contact with it anyway. Is that correct? Yeah, for the scent portion, um, it's a double wire cage, so there's about an inch and a half space between the two uh, sections of wire. So you can literally rub your hands on it. There's this like no chance they're going to bite through it. Um, so those ones are safe, and those ones are always going to be hot because again, can they smell the venom? Can they not? Who knows, would the venom duct surgery prevent the scent of venom from emanating? We really don't know, but we're just trying to look at every uh, possibility. A lot of companies who do this um, muzzle their snakes, which is a safe, effective method. But for me personally, um, I just don't like kind of what that does to the snakes because you have to actually physically restrain the snake to put the muzzle on. You have to restrain them again to take the muzzle off. You do that repeatedly, and I've seen it countless times where yeah. these muzzled snakes don't even act like snakes. They act like limp noodles. They're just kind of like, whatever, I guess this is how I'm going to die, and they lay there, and they don't act like a snake at all. Oh, uh, kind of a versus, snake depression, huh? <laughs> yeah, kind of. You know, I, I think what it is is they know that they've been uh, restrained. I mean, they're not dumb animals. They know they can't open their mouth. Um, you know, the first few times you muzzle them, they probably, you know, are still figuring things out. But after that, I think they just give up. And, um, you know, I'm not sure about how the long-term effect of those snakes in captivity is because um, I've never done that for myself. Um, but, uh, you know, just seeing how the whole process goes, I, I think it's a lot more humane for the snake to undergo a just a really short, minimally invasive procedure. They don't know it ever happened. They go to sleep, they wake up, maybe they got their little sore. I mean, within days, they're eating and acting normal, and that they're normal from that day for the rest of their lives. Uh, whereas, you know, the other ones have to kind of continuously be manipulated, and I think that's probably far more stressful on them in the long term. Sure, and uh, for the snakes that are muzzled, the people that do that, you don't do that, but the, for the people that do practice that, every time you're restraining the snake to muzzle it, you're putting, I mean, they're putting themselves in danger, obviously. It just takes one time to mess up, and they could get bitten. Exactly. Um, and that was another factor. Um, is, yeah, you are putting yourself at risk each and every time you have to do that. You know, my snakes, I don't, physically touch them unless maybe I have to do something, uh, you know, to help them out. Duck shed, which almost never happens. I mean, they're all designed to live in this kind of environment. Um, every once in a while, maybe they'll get a piece of bark in their mouth or something like that, you know, that I'll have to tube them and, and pull that out or something along those lines. But otherwise, you know, it's hands off. I treat all the venomoids exactly the same as the hot. They use all the same equipment. Um, and, uh, you know, I have, I actually have three that I picked up 16 years ago. Um, I've been doing this for 17 years and I still have them to this day. They're doing wonderfully. One actually produced babies last year. Uh, they're fat, they're happy, they're healthy. I don't use them for the dog training anymore. They've done their due diligence. Um, but I will still use them for educational displays and programs. And, uh, you know, one thing again that I think differentiate us from others who do this training is the snakes are not just tools. Um, I, I have as much respect and, and care for the snakes 
just as well as any other animal, and I'll keep them till the day they die naturally on their own. Right, and uh, so you do these classes uh, all throughout. You do them in Nevada and Northern California. Where do you have classes coming up in the near future? Okay, uh, yeah, we do uh, have classes throughout all of Nevada, um, a lot of Northern California, even uh, Utah and Colorado. We've um, actually been talking to some people about doing some classes up in Oregon and Idaho as well. Um, the upcoming classes, you know, we're going to get into the later season for us. Um, not this coming week. The first weekend in August, we're going to be in Sonoma, California, then in Sacramento. Uh, we have something coming up in Susanville, Penn Valley, uh, which is up by Nevada City area, um, Rockland, and, uh, of course, Las Vegas. We, we do two or three classes a year in Las Vegas. Uh, so we still have quite a few classes coming up. And we do have a calendar on our Facebook page. Um, quite easy to find us. It's search and get rattled. And there we are. Um, and uh, we also have a website, getrattled.org, that has a calendar of events. That one's usually a, a week or two behind the calendar on Facebook because um, I don't know how to do my own website. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And so if people, if people have like a business or property or they want to host a Get Rattled uh, seminar or whatever you want, a class session, um, they can get in contact with you and they can do that at their, at their own place, right? Absolutely. In fact, I would say the vast majority of classes we have, probably 90% of them are through hosts. Um, obviously, it makes sense for them to be able to advertise locally. It's a lot easier for, for them than it would be for us. But it's also a community that they get to offer. And uh, it's a fundraiser because, you know, we give a percentage of uh, whatever comes in to that host. Um, and we've hosted with all different kinds of people. We do a lot with veterinarians, um, we a lot of dog clubs, um, occasionally, you know, sporting clubs. Um, we even did one class for a... Uh, water acrobatics club <laughs> uh, so we're, we're not picky you know so long as the club uh, is interested in doing this um we even do a, a few for uh, with events like henderson nevada a uh, event called bark in the park and um they have us come out and during their festival we have an area off the beaten path where people can come and do training right there and then. Uh, we have another one coming up in Rockland at Woofstock. That's going to be the end of August. Um, so we even have, yeah, parks and recs and, and cities and, and all them ask us to come and, and do these classes for them. That's very good. And it's just one of the amazing things that you do uh, for people that own pets. We'll talk about some other stuff that you do some other time. But, uh, John, I know you got to get going here soon. I appreciate you taking time to talk about uh, the work you do training uh, dogs, doing the rattle, uh, rattlesnake avoidance training in Nevada and in California and other states, it sounds like. So if people want to get a hold of you, they can go through the website. Uh, we'll go ahead and link that in the description of this video, and we'll link to your Facebook page as well if they want to get a hold of you. And also they could take a look at the calendars to see if uh, there's an event coming up near you, right? And uh, they can go ahead and schedule a session with you guys. It sounds really interesting, the work you do. It sounds like it'd be a lot of fun traveling, working with snakes, and working with dogs. If you like dogs, it sounds like a lot of fun. It really is. You know, um, I, I feel very lucky. Uh, I've been into reptiles most of my life since I was, I was young. Um, I got lucky that I had a, a mentor who taught me how to handle venomous reptiles, and I've always just had that fascination. And it's great that I was able to create something that I love doing that helps people, that helps animals, um, and maybe one day I'll even be able to make a living doing it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it pays for the travel and stuff you get to do. is a lot of fun. All right, John Potash, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk with me today. It's great. Get rattled. Hey, thank you very much. All right. Uh, and for those of you listening, if you want to go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel, there's lots of videos and interviews like this. Go ahead and do that. Go ahead and just take a second, go ahead and click that, and you can go to our Facebook page, Edgar Ortega Radio Show. You can subscribe there and on Instagram. We'll put all that in the description of this video. Um, until next time, uh, thank you for listening to the Edgar Ortega Radio Show.